Well, the Federal Reserve raised rates for the 11th time last week, just before receiving a cooler inflation report on the Fed's favored inflation gauge. Wall Street thinks the Fed should be finished raising rates, but policymakers see one more rate hike before the end of this year. So how much more work is there left to do? And a first on Yahoo Finance, I want to bring into the program president of the Chicago Federal Reserve, Austin Goolsby. President Goolsby, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me back. So you voted to raise rates again last week. And since then, we've gotten a reading on your favorite inflation gauge, core PCE, showing an easing in inflation for the month of June, sort of echoing what we saw with the CPI report for that same month. And we also got some cooler wage growth data for the second quarter. So taking this data together with last week's rate hike, how restrictive do you see the policy right now? Well, uh, I, it was fabulous news uh, to get inflation, to see that inflation's coming down in this way. And it's important to note there's different ways you can view inflation. And we tend to look backwards for over the last year. But the new information, of course, is just the monthly uh, reading. And the monthly readings have been coming in quite good. Uh, so our goal is to stick on what I call the golden path which is let's get inflation down without causing a major recession. And that will be a triumph for the Fed, a historic triumph. It's very seldom happened that way. We've never been able to get inflation down even as much as we've gotten it down so far without a recession. So the restrictiveness of the policy rate, we're going we're gonna to have to play by ear and we'll get several more major data points before the next meeting, but it, it's it's looking like we're walking the line pretty well. Okay, I wanna come back to that in just a second, but before that, last time you and I spoke back in May, you were worried about the early innings of a credit crunch. We're now more than four months since the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, other regional bank failures. How do you view credit conditions now? Uh, so far, that's been the dog that that has not been barking. So it's we've we've seen a stabilization in the bank sector. We've seen money coming back into bank deposits. Whenever you get a rate tightening cycle like the one that that we've experienced, where we're we're up 500 basis points, you know, in 15 months, let's let's call it, that will mean tighter credit conditions. But so far, we have not seen anything tighter on the credit conditions than what you would expect for such a tight rating cycle. So that's been heartening to see. Okay, so you mentioned things are looking pretty good on the inflation front. You got that better PCE number, the better CPI number. Uh, the dog hasn't barked, like you just said, on credit conditions. So how much more work do you see left to do to really bring inflation down from here? Well, that, that's the key question. Uh, thus far, I think we have been disproving the, the folks that have a, let's call it a stable Phillips curve in their mind, that the only way to get inflation down is to crank up the unemployment rate and engineer a recession. And there are a great many economists who have been arguing that. The last six months have proven that wrong. And the stable Phillips curve idea was kind of broken before there ever was COVID. And now we're coming out of COVID and it's broken again. And as I say, two brokens do not make it fixed. I think let's, let's follow the data. And this business cycle was so sufficiently strange and sufficiently unusual that I don't think that the normal rules of a direct trade-off between unemployment and inflation necessarily have to apply. They certainly have not applied in the last six months. So to your point, given the resiliency that we're seeing, does that still allow you for more room to do one more rate hike later this year? I don't know. As you know, Jennifer, I'm not a fan of tying our hands before we get the data. We still have months before the next meeting. I will say thus far, we're on the golden path. And let's we, we, we got to walk that line. We're going to stick to it. But that effort to get inflation down thus far is working. And if we can do that without generating a major recession, that's a big achievement for the Fed.
you've been a fan of moving more cautiously. Do you feel it would be prudent to skip the September policy meeting to allow for more time to collect data and then decide whether you would want to raise rates again later in the fall? I don't know. You know, it's a hypothetical. We're going to get multiple important observations about both inflation and the job market between now and September. And I'm open to reading the data. If there's a major change of conditions, uh, I haven't made up my mind for what should happen in September. But this golden path, which so far we're sticking on that line, that would be a triumph, and and it's certainly a possibility at this point. Certainly a possibility to skip September or to stop raising rates if you have enough good inflation by September. Well, uh, 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 as I say, uh, all of the above, there's nothing off the table. There's nothing specifically on the table. Let's not tie our hands of what we're going to do before we get the, the information. So far, we've gotten inflation down without a recession and indeed without even raising the unemployment rate, a thing that many economists said was literally impossible. So let's keep, keep our eye on the new monthly inflations in core, both goods and services and housing, because the goods inflation, we've seen nice progress, Housing is now supposed to start dropping. The housing inflation is supposed to start dropping as we get the market rents kind of flowing through into the, into the way the index is calculated. And anything that we're getting in the near term reducing services inflation is in a sense just an added bonus because we have not thought, we, we have always thought that to be the stickiest part of inflation that we've seen actually some progress on that front was unexpected and, and a nice bonus. So in order to move into that extended hold, if we were to get a couple more readings on core inflation, similar to the last couple that we received, would the data suggest stopping? Well, the, you, you saw the median SEP at, at, the, uh, at an earlier Fed meeting. And I will just point out the market expectations about rates are pretty similar to what's in the SEP, even a little less aggressive. And yet the market expectations of inflation are firmly anchored uh, right around the target. And that's, that's what you want on the golden path. And it doesn't forecast a major recession to do that. And that will be a triumph. If we get to that and we come into September uh, on the golden path, I think everybody will be feeling good about where we are. All right, so maybe that that could have marked the peak then if we continued on this golden path, and it sounds like. Then kind of looking ahead, eventually as you look to hold rates for some time at you know certain elevated levels, as inflation comes down, how will you judge whether the policy rate has become too restrictive and needs to be trimmed? That's super important. That's the balancing act of, of walking the line is that once, once you find the golden path, you got to stay on it and, and you got to just keep monitoring the new information. Now, I've seen a lot of people trying to emphasize wages, almost treating it like it's a leading indicator for price inflation. And the only thing I will observe is that historically it's not at all. Wages lag price inflation. They do not, they're not a leading indicator of it. So I, I would caution everybody, don't, don't make too much up about inflation prediction when you see what wages are doing. It's more like what's happening to price inflation today is the indicator of what will happen to wages six months from now. All right. And then before we wrap up, I do want to get your thoughts on the proposed capital requirements uh, last week from uh, Vice Chair of Supervision Michael Barr. How do you think that these capital proposals will impact lending as well as liquidity in capital markets? And do you think that they could address some of the problems that led to the downfall of Silicon Valley Bank and other regional bank failures? Well, Jennifer, as you know, I'm a long time advocate of high capital in the, in the entire financial system, but especially in the banking sector. I'm, uh, it's, it's not the role of the, of the regional banks to set policy. That comes from the board in D.C. 
But I will say that the in, in an environment like the one we're in, where we've raised rates quite a lot in a short period, anything you can do on the macro prudential side to strengthen the banking sector and keep it resilient and prevent financial crisis, that, that's a big win. It's important that we do that at the same time we're trying to navigate this golden path of getting inflation down. All right, President Goolsby, we'll have to leave the conversation there. But thank you so much for your insight, as always. Look forward to speaking with you soon. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. That's Austin Goolsby, president of the Chicago Federal Reserve.